Welcome to Queso Day, the first of its edition. And um, I was inspired by Ed's Pancake Day last semester. And so I looked up, you know, what are the national holidays on Wednesdays? And it happens, our beloved queso that all of us are very familiar with with Tex-Mex food is today. And so we have a series of viscous fluid related talks because, you know, queso is a viscous fluid. I do not have a slide to back this up, however, we do have a lot of interesting talks about all the viscous related research that goes on here at UTIG. And so just to get y'all started and also speakers, you can press forward from my computer here. And if it doesn't go forward, just press on the pad. But I figured it'd be great to introduce a national queso timeline for those that may not be as familiar. And so around 1900, Tex-Mex food arrives in San Antonio um, through um, Otis Farnsworth, whoever that is, thank you, uh, because we get to enjoy this day today. Um, and around 1918, that's when the Velveeta brand, the cheese brand, introduced this cheese, but it actually didn't get popular until 1939 when it was featured in a recipe. However, this is a twister um, or a plot twist. You think that queso is mainly based in Texas, but its roots actually come from a restaurant in Arkansas called Little Mexico to be the first establishment to serve up this beloved cheese dip. And so it was introduced later in a Velveeta cookbook. Um, and so, yeah, now that's the history of Kingston, I guess. And so enjoy. And first up, we have Krista. So I uh, opted to talk about basal magma ocean dynamos because they are the most viscous thing that I work on, which isn't that viscous, <laughs> it turns out. Um, so the kind of motivation behind this is I just got like an NSF grant to do some modeling of this work. So this is a reminder of what I promised to do because I haven't read the proposal in 10 months. So <laughs> um, bear with me if I forget some details. But the figure is basically just kind of illustrating this idea for Venus. So Venus has this like super thick atmosphere that's in the yellow. As a solid mantle, it's thought to arguably have this basal make motion. So that's basically like a liquid part of the, the mantle of a uh, uh, metallic core. <clears throat> so that's just one place where basal magma oceans might be relevant, but it also could be relevant for the early Earth. So that's kind of illustrated by this one, where you could have a totally liquid iron core, this basal magma ocean, and a solid mantle on top of that. And that's really uh, important because early on in the Earth magnetic uh, early history before the solid inner core form, we know that there was an ancient magnetic field. So the question is, what created this ancient magnetic field before the inner core started to solidify? And the basal magma ocean is one hypothesis to explain that magnetic field generation. And then on Venus, as I mentioned, this is also a potentially um, feature at present day in terms of this basal magma ocean, but it also comes into play of Venus having no um, intrinsic magnetic field today. So that could play a role into why that never happened, or if it did, where we might look for signatures on the surface for this uh, crustal remnant magnetization. <laughs> And then the third one that I'm going to mostly focus on is the moon. So the moon also had an ancient magnetic field um, that's really strong. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But it's often thought that it is created in this tiny little core at the center of the body. But that turns out to be really hard to explain. So we put forward this idea that maybe there's this basal magma ocean that creates a magnetic field instead. Okay, so I mentioned that I'm going to focus on the moon to just give you kind of a better um, sense of how this relates to the magnetic field. On the y-axis is the magnetic field strength of the moon's uh, field at the surface as a function of age and billions of years. And the thing to notice is that you have this strong field epoch early on in its history, and then you have a low field epoch later on in the moon's history. And when the field was really strong, it's actually stronger than the Earth's magnetic field today. So it's like really strong. Mm -hmm. And then it's much more moderate as you get closer out to present day. <clears throat> So we've done some work looking at how a potential liquid layer um, in the mantle could couple with the core in terms of creating magnetic fields. But if you have this you know, region of liquid on top, it acts as kind of a buffer to the heat removal of the core, which you need to drive the dynamo. So this is just a magnetic field from a thermal evolution model. The, if the magnetic field was generated in the base of the ocean, it would be in this timeline at about this amplitude. And in this scenario, you only have convection in the core right after the inner core starts to solidify and then you get a field strength that can kind of vary depending on different assumptions that you make that's kind of on, a, on the order of what you expect from the observations. 
You could also tweak the parameters of the core and you can get intermittent thermal convection in the core that is kind of coinciding with the um, magnetic field being generated in the spatial magma ocean. And then you again get this big jump in terms of field generation um, once the intercore starts to solidify. But what we've done so far hasn't considered that the basal magma ocean could be electrically conducting. So that's going to have, in addition to a thermal um, link between the core and the basal magma ocean, you're also going to have an electromagnetic coupling, which is going to be really important for magnetic field generation. And you could also have like mixing and a lot more um, viscous coupling between the two regions that hasn't been looked at yet. <clears throat> so we're going to be doing some numerical dynamo modeling, <clears throat> looking at how those two regions couple. And one of the big things is this electrical conductivity. So this is just some estimates of what the electrical conductivity is in the <clears throat> case of Navy Ocean. And this is a contrast in the iron core. So the thing to notice is that there are quite a few orders of magnitude different. So you're going to have two big region differences that we're going to have to incorporate in our models. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't have a really great graph for this, but in terms of like the viscous diffusion and the heat uh, diffusion, that's measured through this parental number. So in the lunar <clears throat> basal magma ocean, it's relatively viscous, but more viscous than queso, it turns out. <laughs> no, less viscous than queso. Sorry, I had that backwards. So that's going to be on the order of like 10 to the 2. But if you look at the lunar core, then you're going to estimate this frontal number um, as 10 to the minus 2. So there's four orders of magnitude difference in the material properties that we have to consider between these two models, um, two regions of the planet. <clears throat> so that's going to be something that um, we're going to do in the models. And then just for, for reference, parental number of queso turns out to be 10 to the three to 10 to the four. Um, I kind of went down a rabbit hole a little bit. <laughs> Actual literature on the um, thermophysical properties of queso, um, which I will probably read later. <laughs> so, yes, totally. <laughs> yeah, so we're gonna do these um, three-dimensional dynamo simulations that model the core and the basal magma ocean as two distinct regions, but allow them to couple between um, thermally and viscously and electromagnetically. And we're going to couple that with these thermal evolution models like you showed in terms of estimated magnetic field strength over time. So we're going to do that using the magic code that I've been using for, for many years. <clears throat> and then this will be divided into, <clears throat> excuse me, into three tasks. Um, the first one's going to look at there being stable versus convecting regions in both the core and the basal magma ocean. So there's different combinations of those that are more relevant to the earlier Venus and the moon. So we're going to do kind of a systematic survey of seeing about the, the role of stable stratification. <clears throat> and then we're also going to look at models that have these radially variable transport properties. So the first thing to do is just make it super simple and not include any of these variations between the basal magma ocean and the core. But then we're going to incorporate models that do have those differences <clears throat> in terms of electrical connectivity, frontal number, et cetera. And then we're basically going to have these dynamo models that are snapshots that are going to fit into these thermal evolution models. So we can then relate that to a much broader parameter sweep because these dynamo models are really expensive and thermal evolution models are really uh, cheap numerically. So we're going to try to come up with like a best scenario history that can explain the early Earth's magnetic field, the early moon's magnetic field, and give us some. Um, insights into the magnetic field of Venus over time. Mm -hmm. So that's my spiel about basic magnetic motion. Oh, it's if we have time for questions. Questions, queries, Mina. I don't know if this was like implicit or not, but were like tidal forces taken into account in any of these models? No. <clears throat> That's really hard. <laughs> so, no, we haven't. But there are um, ideas that maybe like some type of tides could have played a role in ancient magnetic fields. So, that's something that we could look into. But not at this <laughs> Yeah. You mentioned the very beginning of you know, uh, early Earth's magnetic field. What kind of constraints are there on the Archean or even further Zoic Earth's magnetic field? Um, so, there are a few. Um, like paleo made it examples, I think probably from like the Allen Hills region in terms of like the, the um, I want to say force, but that feels wrong. Um, yeah, the zircons. Zircons, yeah. that's the one. Yeah, so there's um, some evidence from those types of lab analyses of those types of rocks that gives us those examples. So you said you're going to start with the, the normal kind of modeling, then incorporate smaller layers or complexity. So 
this problem I have with all, every model. What, what are your anchors? Uh, what do you compare? The, just the physics or just how the model fits or you compare it to a system like Earth? Do you know the dynamics? Or how, what do you use? To, this is right, better than this one. Uh, um, very good question. So usually I think about physics as being the, the anchor. And then since we do have some constraints on what the magnetic field amplitude is and the rough timing, then those would be how we <clears throat> further refine in terms of like this seems physically plausible versus it matches these observations. So it's kind of like our best guess. Let's thank Chris all the time. <laughs> Okay, good. So that is, uh, uh, I worked on this, uh, I worked on this topic when, uh, during my PhD a time ago, and somehow I would like to actually try to revive the set point, especially because it's been, it's been of interest for a recent uh, science debate that emerged in the Martian community some years ago. So is there IC district faults on Mars? And especially at the South Polar Cap of Mars, which is called the South Polar Layer Deposit, which is a kind of a, Big ice sheet, which is approximately 60% in volume, the size of the, of the Greenland ice sheet, mainly made of water ice with some kind of CO2 ice components in it, which can be up to 3.7 kilometers thick at some places. And it's made of isochrones that are deposited like on Earth uh, by some precipitation, but mainly by condensation on the atmosphere. Uh, this is a specific part called Utilov of this of the South Polar Cap, the SPLD. And you can see now that you have in this part of this some very specific shapes, some scarps that are uh, that are bow shaped a bit everywhere here and there. This is the inventory of them. There is at least about 160, 67 scarps all around this part. Uh, they are quite big, about 10 to 30 kilometers in, in width, and they are all, they all face more or less the same uh, quadrant of the SPD, which is here. So early on, some initial hypothesis proposed that that could be Barkan dunes, i.e. some Aeolian uh, dunes formed by, by the wind and the transport of sediments uh, on, the, on the cap. But first, this has been this proved, especially because if we if, if you zoom up some of those scarves here and you take the topographic profile of them, so this is profile 2A to 2A prime, you can see that you have this kind of asymmetric shape that is uh, that is uh, dug into the ice. This is the surface of the ice. This is uh, the bedrock, so the bedrock that we estimated from radar sounding is somewhere within this gray area. So we don't have a very huge vertical Resolution, we can see that it uh, it is actually buried uh, in, within more than half of the thickness of the ice sheet. So this is approximately 400 meters uh, high, and you have this straight wall that has a slope of about 10 degrees uh, and lower. So this is uh, the, the, the vertical scale is times 10 here. This is the same vertical and horizontal scale. So you have a straight wall with a convex facing a convex slope. It's always the same profile. And that's why they have been called the large asymmetric polar gaps, the laps of the balls. So using some other kind of radar sounding data, we've been able to actually uh, try to detect some ice open layers, some layers of ice within the ice sheet near there, so that uh, we did infer from it some kind of geostructural, uh, we did a geostructural analysis of those crops. And what we can see from those radiograms here, so this is the surface, the layers, and, uh, and imageries of that, is that uh, always on the straight wall, what you can see is that you have the layers that are still very horizontal, and those are in blue here, and you do see actually outcrops on visible imagery, saying that actually those layers, they, they continue and outcrop the straight wall. We don't see any outcrop the convex wall, and those layers actually bend down, sounds to bend down on the radar It's not perfect image, but combined with the, with the imagery, we can actually assess that both the layers are not outcropping the convex wall. So in the end, we have infer a kind of structure uh, at the really first order, which is like this. You have those scarps that are 10 to 30 kilometers uh, wide, 400 meters high, 
with layers out computer straight pool and some convex slopes that are bending downwards. We don't know exactly what is there because you have the radar is not able to see something here because of this corner vectors formed by the junctions of the of the two walls. And you have the bedrock somewhere somewhere here. Okay. So from this the only hypothesis that does exist now, and so we put aside the Mark and Dune hypothesis of Aeolian formation, because those are dug within the ice. So the only hypothesis to explain those is district faulting. District faulting is basically very common on terrestrial sedimentary units when you have an extensional regime. You have first, uh, uh, you are in an extensional regime, you have a fault. Uh, that uh, arises and bending downward. The hanging wall is separating and gradually as this one, this hanging wall is sliding, uh, a rollover anticline starts to form because the, the layers are bending downwards because of the shape of this specific slope. And afterwards, if you have further extension, you could uh, have antithetic faults that could appear. And here I put a radiogram over one of those labs showing the profile we have that might actually, we might even be able to see some results at the surface of those antithetic faultings, right? This is an example of a seismic, uh, of a seismogram on Earth uh, in, uh, at the Boyan Bo, uh, Bo High Gulf in China, which is an undersea, so it's, those are oceanic sediments. So the outcomes of this is that it's easy to actually calculate what kind of horizontal displacement you have uh, of the ice from those falls, because those two area A and B should be the same. And from this, you can infer H. And that corresponds to a displacement of three to five kilometers per lapse, right? And you have 167 of them, at least, over the whole thing. It does also imply that you have a, de a horizontal decolement at a point, either at the bed, right? Or it could be also between two incompetent layers within the ice. For example, between a CO2 ice layer and a water ice layer. So we, it's hard to actually, with the vertical resolution we have for the localization of the bedrock, it's hard to infer more where the decolement is. And that means also, and you will understand the link to viscosity, uh, that means that we have a brittle behavior that is dominant over ductile behavior by opposition to what we see on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so some outstanding questions of this is, how can we test further this least fault hypothesis? Well, we have actually maybe to make some additional geostructural analysis from new data we have from the last 10 years, right? And from this, try to test for this hypothesis, right? especially regarding the, the mechanism the, and the horology of the ice. Is that possible? And maybe a part of the answer for this first outstanding question is actually why is there no listrict faulting on terrestrial ice sheets? Listrict faults on Earth are mainly many in sedimentary materials. There's none of them in Antarctica, none of them in Greenland. So, what does it mean? Different biology? Are we dominated by brittle behavior on, on Mars and not on, on Earth? Same question could happen for, for queso. You know, imagine you have just a centimeter thick uh, the sheet of queso on Earth. Will it behave the same on Earth than Mars? <laughs> no. Okay. Same for ice sheets, right? Uh, and maybe actually the, uh, the flow rate uh, on, on Earth is is uh, uh, is shorter actually? Shorter, so it's shorter than the formation time scale of those carbs, mm -hmm. right? Or no, that's right. You don't see them, okay? And so also another, and that's the last thing. Question is: Is there any relationship with this with the bright basal reflector? What is that? So that's here. So in two thousand eighteen, uh, the Mars is radar sonder, and you can see a radiogram here with the surface of the bedrock here to detect. Exactly here with its blue, a very bright basal reflector. And there is a hypothesis in the community that, that, that and there is no consensus on that, but a hypothesis that that could be liquid water, mm -hmm. right? Either it is a lake or either it is a kind of a, a water saturated sediment at the base, right? And interestingly, this is just upstream of all of those gigantic fields of labs, you know? So could that actually? provide some kind of um, 
lubricated material to allow the ice cap to actually slide and create those slabs. Or maybe uh, it's actually just a, a very flat but bright reflector because it's flat. And even if it's flat, that could allow also the ice sheet to, to, to provide this decolement, horizontal decolement that the lapse hypothesis needs. Right. And yeah, I think that's it. I'm shocked, please. <laughs> One question. Come, query. Come. Is it only in that region where you might have water, or is it across the whole ice sheet? This one? Yeah. Yeah, so it's possible the, the, the reflection here is really bright and it's compatible with liquid water. Okay. But a part of the community is saying that actually it could be something else. And that's where the debate is. Is it only in that 20 part? A what? Is it only in that small section or is it? A so that's part? not, so uh, it sounds like uh, the team that is proposing this liquid water hypothesis is focusing only on this region. It sounds like Elsewhere or below the cap, there's other regions that are as bright as that, actually. And, and that will be a problem because it's hard to, to create liquid water at the base, it's really cold, right? Mm -hmm. And and if there is other bright reflectors all around, that means that you would need a gigantic thermal anomaly, which is highly unlikely. Um, so yeah, it sounds like there is other bright reflectors, but for now they are focusing on this one. Cool. Thank you so much, Mikey. I must thank Sarah one more time. <laughs> Next in the case of thing, coming back to Earth, we have Ethan and Earthquake. Hey. Cool. Thanks for having me. Yeah, in honor of Queso Day, I want to talk about sticky situations, the role of melt and earthquakes. And this work was done with <laughs> these nice people here. <laughs> Um, so to investigate melting during earthquakes, uh, we tested plexiglass in a machine here at UT called ECOR, which is the Energy Controlled Rotary Apparatus. Um, it's on main campus in Nicola Tassado's lab. It's a pretty simple and compact machine. It has these four columns that hold up the sample assembly and loading assembly. The loading assembly is simply uh, barbell plates that you put on top and that applies a normal load to the surface. And then we apply a torque using a motor that loads a clock spring which applies a linearly increasing torque to the surface, which kind of more realistically simulates earthquakes than your traditional apparatus. We instrument the machine with a variety of sensors, including a load cell, torque cell, acoustic emission sensors to measure the sound waves um, from each lab quake event. And then we have a vertical displacement sensor and then this uh, different, like other different uh, displacement sensors. So to see some of these uh, lab quake events, we have time versus friction with the friction increasing. So the frictional coefficient is simply the shear stress over the normal stress. So this is showing the torquing of these two samples and then the failure of the interface. So this would be a lab quake or an earthquake in reality. So why PMMA? Why not like normal rock? Um, PMMA uh, is used for a variety of purposes. So it's used in the beauty world and the art world. Um, it's used in industry, and that's because it's easy to fabricate, machine, and thermoform, and you can also see through it. So that's really cool because we can observe the interface evolving as the lab quake is occurring. Um, it also, uh, its behavior also resembles crustal rocks, and it has a similar homologous temperature. So the homologous temperature of PMMA is 0.7, so this is the ratio between the surrounding temperature and its melting temperature. And the homologous temperature of granite at depth is also 0.7, assuming some thermal gradient and 17 kilometers. So what we're interested is, in is monitoring um, the strengthening and weakening on the fault provided by this melting mechanism um, through the uh, mechanical sensors that we have. So monitoring the slip velocity and then the energy fluxes derived from different velocities and stresses, and then trying to understand the relationship with the acoustic emissions. Um, so this is a super classic diagram uh, in earthquake studies. Uh, this just shows total slip distance against shear stress, and the area in this, uh, the area inside of this polygon <laughs> um, is captured by the fracture, uh, fracture energy, radiated energy, and frictional energy, and those components make up the total energy budget during an earthquake. 
And this guy or this group, uh, Wretches et al., says that slip will continue on a fault if the energy flux to the fault is greater than the rate of energy dissipation by friction. So if friction can dissipate all that energy, it's going to stop. And frictional energy is greater than 70% of the total energy budget. So it's important and thus that energy flux um, plays an important role in the uh, mechanics of earthquakes. And so the energy flux is simply the um, rate of change of work of, of energy provided from the spring over that interface compared to the energy that can be dissipated by those frictional mechanisms over that interface. So here we have the results from one of our experiments, our sample up here. Um, we have multiple phases depending on our methodology. So what we do is we start with a, a low spring loading rate, 0.15 megapascal per second. Then we turn up the machine to try to kick uh, this melting process into gear because we want to reduce the period between earthquakes so that there's less time for heat to dissipate, that heat can kind of build and cause melting. And we're gonna focus on phase C here where we have the largest events and the highest temperatures. And we're just gonna look at one event from phase C. So what we're looking at is time for shear stress on the left. That's this gray and black curve here. And we're seeing the uh, slight increase in shear stress until you get to the peak shear stress and then a sudden drop. So that's the earthquake or the lab quake occurring. And then you have sliding, and you can see on the right axis, the velocity increasing. So sliding is, occur is occurring when the velocity is over zero, obviously. And then the event is stopping right around here, and it actually reverses because of inertial forces. So um, flash weakening, so the weakening of this interface occurs over some thermal slip distance. And this is uh, what we're going to call VW. And VW is this equation, but we find that it's 0.2 to 0.7 meters per second. So that's these dashed horizontal lines here and also illuminated in red. So we can say that the interface is in a thermally weakened state after this one phase. So this would be the flash weakening phase up until it once again crosses that critical weakening velocity. Now we're looking at time versus the energy flux and power density. So again, the energy flux is what's provided by the spring. The power density is what's dissipated by friction. And Rech has said that slip continues if the power density um, by friction until the power de density by friction exceeds that by the spring. So we're looking at this crossover point here. Um, we'll skip that, but we're looking at this crossover point where these two curves intersect. So at this point, you have the deceleration of slip. The melt is starting to cool and thicken and viscously strengthen the interface. So this is kind of like a car. So if you're holding down the clutch on your vehicle and you're pushing the gas and you drop the clutch, you have a burnout. And that's because the energy flux provided by the motor to the wheels exceeds that that can be dissipated by frictional mechanisms between the tires and, um, and, the, and the road. And you may have some melting of the tires even in there. So there could be some Cool behavior similar to what we're seeing. So here's a video from some high frame rate recordings we took during um, one of these events. So what you have is this patch of pseudotacolite, which is the bond, the, the cooled melt. It breaks and you have this melt weakening and you can see the melt patch growing and thickening across the interface. And so this would be a melt lubrication phase. And then you have the onset of viscous strengthening and the deceleration of slip until the end of the event. And looking at SEM images, we have the car spinning in the background. <laughs> um, we can see these uh, ductile deformation features, these kind of stretched melt fil filaments, kind of like you're pulling your tortilla chip out of your dab of queso and stretching out that cheese. And then um, kind of a final uh, interesting thing is looking at the acoustic emissions data. Um, we can track those same mechanisms. So converting uh, the time series into a spectrogram, we see different um, kind of flashes in power on the spectrogram associated with those different phases. We see this initial flash associated with the flash weakening, this kind of silence in the acoustic emissions, possibly due to the attenuation of the sound waves um, by the melt. And then when you have this viscous deceleration, and, and uh, sorry, this slip deceleration and viscous strengthening, it's like you're slamming on the brakes of your car and everything's stopping and it's emitting um, many more uh, sound waves. So 
uh, that's it. And then these are the people that helped me out. So thank you. <laughs> So the fault is between these two acrylic. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we have two cylinders and then right. we slide them past each other exactly. How um, have you? Do you think it would be possible to use other geometries or like how important is geometry in maybe like further localizing or changing the distribution of like where mill is happening and how it impacted the stuff. It's it's hugely important. Yeah, you could for rotary shear, it's makes the most sense to use cylinders. Right. Um, but you could do other types of experiments where you had blocks sliding against each other or something like that. But the thing with rotary shear is the velocity is going to increase towards the uh, as the radius gets larger. So you probably have more melting on the outside because the velocity the slip velocity is going to be higher there, and then really kind of no melting and maybe even the pooling of the melt in the center. Cool. Thank you, Ethan. I'm finished with the slide with uh, Claudio and uh, Thorsten, which are also involved in this project. And uh, I would like to start with a comic anecdote about this project that it's probably most related to the viscosity, the topic of here. So imagine that January 2017, Southampton, me and my good friend Matthew Ajayas, when he was postdoc in Southampton, and I was last year at PhD walking out of the National Oceanography Center. It's gray, it's raining, we're soaked. And we went to this bar and, and uh, Matthew said, uh, let's have a drink. And then we ordered to get warm, some black bean soup, highly kind of moldy thing, <laughs> highly unrecommended. If you're in England, don't drink black bean soup. <laughs> and then my friend uh, Matthew with his heavy mountain ex uh, accent says, Eric, uh, we are from the Mediterranean. But let's think about something that a project that we'll do together as a Mediterranean. After a few drinks, we came up with this project uh, and we kind of build up the story. And then that actually was the first project I was supposed to submit while I arrived here. But then we ask NSFOC, they say that's very good, very nice idea. Too challenging, too high risk for us to be lead, take it to ERC, and then come to us to pick their on that. So we're hoping to submit it uh, this year while first the uh, ERC and then us. But it's all started with a horrible black bean soup. <laughs> <laughs> the, the idea here is basically we designed a, a marine PM and seismic experiment to understand complexity of, uh, of uh, this region, Sicilian channel. Okay, so it's situated between two plates, Europe and Africa, uh, which are kind of converging and in close proximity to the Calabrian arc. There's lots of fault, fractures, interplate volcanism, and I told you it's not, it's not a big factor. And, uh, and there is a lot of seismicity and earthquakes and tsunami that affect basically four countries, uh, Libya, Tunisia, Malta, although Malta is, and Italy. So in that region over here, there's also lots of communication pipelines a lot of industry uh, kind of uh, oil lines and, and it, so it has social and economical value. Now, just to people who are not familiar, to Rodeo, uh, uh, basically flow, mental flow, it's uh, it's horizontal and to Rodeo, it's vertical, can go both way. And this is kind of the Calabrian arc and it's represented by slab robot that possibly caused that. Now, all this area, that's Sicilian channel, this is our study, it's really poorly constrained uh, to the deeper part because there's not much work or studies that have been done over there. So you're saying strong? Okay. No. Just once. Okay. <laughs> Slow computer. It's very viscous. <laughs> Highly viscous. Uh, so, yeah, it's a shift. Anyway, so what's our motivation was to understand continental breakup in a complex tectonics, which normally it's not a classic place to study this, to study uh, the, uh, breakup like the afar. It's very clear, you have metal going, spreading. And then uh, obviously that Calabrian art was well studied by Facena and our good friend uh, Torston. 
And uh, a funny Toshton story about that. When I first pitched him to that idea to him, as you can see, they have the geodynamic models over here, but nothing on the Sicily. He told me, but why we should we go study there? We already know what happened. And I told him, Toshton, do you really know what happened? Do you have any observations? I mean, Oh, I see what you're getting with it. Yeah, that, that's probably a good idea to kind of confirm that. But the assumption is that you have this kind of mechanism that you have slab rollback, which is pretty wide, inducing those toroidal and toroidal flows interacting with this Sicily channel. And then we want to understand the dynamics of that and how that can affect the rift evolution and that kind of new microplate creation. That's kind of a, an ideal place to study complex tectonics. So what do we know about, about this Sicily uh, channel rifting zone from existing shallow data set? And this is something that Matthew kind of worked on that uh, in, in some uh, cases in previous studies. But all that we know, it's all from land, land instruments, mostly seismic and measurements uh, and GPS vectors. So you have a GPS, you have volcanism, azimuth, radial anisotropy, cross the thickness, so you can see here, there is rift in those regions, and you can see the surface wave anisotropy are going, are turning into around uh, the back of Sicily. So there's a plate motion that goes this way. You have, you have uh, two plates converging, there is some extension here, and there's also rotational move. So you can see here from the radial anisotropy, all the, uh, the red areas, the horizontal velocity is higher than the vertical. So therefore, it kind of represents extension. And then, um, and then the other way around, the blue areas, they're basically the vertical uh, uh, velocity is higher, which kind of uh, suggests uh, uh, subduction-related volcanism. Now you can see here, look at those two arrows of the GPS on Lampedusa. It's a small island next to Malta, facing that direction. And then the GPS of, the, of this area on the Sicily channel extend. So that area, well, it starts to initiate, there is high seismicity, and this is kind of what we're postulating, it's kind of the breakup uh, branch. While here, again, because it's from seismic uh, instruments from land, there is very little kind of shallow coverage for it, but you can see still that there is a crustal thickness here that uh, thims, so it's kind of uh, pulling upward. So it's complex in that sense, and what do we know about the deep area? So same thing from, from uh, shear velocity and seismic tomography. The main thing here is that you can see all this red area, it's basically lower velocities, which are associated with higher temperature. That means lower viscosity. That means giving room for mental uh, flow upward. And you can see those bars represent their kind of the, the magnitude of, of that kind of uh, radial anisotropy. And you can see, the horizontal motion, and you can see those bars, the small ones are uh, over here in that region, uh, because they're small, it's also kind of represent that there is more, possibly more vertical flow, colloidal flow. So this area is probably highly kind of affected by those uh, uh, viscosity regime. So blue, again, it's vertical flow, and, and red is more uh, horizontal flow. So we designed an experiment that you will heavily kind of uh, sit on electromagnetic imaging. So you can see those red dots. It's kind of the grid I designed over here and over here. Assuming that Calabrian heart is over here. So there is some motion of fluids or mental rolls back. So I want to capture the, the uh, initiation or the front edge of it. And going over here, you can see those all those white uh, areas, uh, dots, which are kind of active uh, electromagnetism, electromagnetic uh, uh, imaging that will help us capture in high resolution all the kind of the, the mechanism or the volcanism and all the fractures and faults in that region to see if we can image the mental flow. And another read over here. The yellow ones are new OBSs, and all the others are it's just like what uh, was used in. Uh, to make those previous plots all seismic uh, land data. And so we'll have a deployment co uh, cruise, come back of the year, pick up the instruments, and hopefully find some answers. So we basically, we're using both electromagnetic, seismic, geodynamic models, and analog models that stores on the genocide. 
and couple that with other, uh, uh, analyze them with other methods that uh, there is basically available data set. So we have a lot of mental processes, specific processes that we want to understand, but the key thing in this entire project is to understand the interplay between deep and shallow uh, tectonic processes that drive this kind of new microplate. That's it. Questions? Yeah, why you didn't use the slides I gave you? <laughs> <laughs> I think the slide looks great, all right? No, it's all offset. <laughs> it's my eyes. Okay, uh, last talk. And five tools. We haven't really talking about ice flow here. Yeah, all right. Well, this has been really, um, fun and I thought I'd bring us home with just a, a little bit about ice. Um, this is a video on the right hand side here of uh, measured velocities of the Greenland ice sheet and it's going to zoom to the sort of pink areas are the fastest flowing ice and the green and yellow areas those are more slow flowing ice and in particular this video is going to zoom in to the northeast part of Greenland. I'm just going to restart it again where you'll notice that the ice flow looks somewhat different than it looks in other parts of Greenland. Um, what I particularly want you to notice is how the, um, rather than sort of broad and diffuse flowing glaciers that we see on the West Coast, we have this sort of long linear feature in the Northeast that goes pretty far into the icy interior. We call that the Northeast Greenland Ice Stream. And it's a pretty um, remarkable and still poorly understood feature why is that ice flowing differently than the rest of the ice in Greenland? And one of the uh, ideas of why that is, is maybe that the viscosity of that ice is different. And that's what connects us to day to queso day. Um, so to think about uh, this question and sort of why we're talking about ice in the first place, the, what I think is fundamental is answering this question, is ice a viscous fluid? We think of ice as a viscous fluid in the way that we model it. And in general, when you see uh, um, articulation of why ice is a viscous fluid, it's because of the relationship between stress and strain in ice. So this is a um, equation for the strain rate of ice and the strain rate is proportional to the stress applied. This here is the second invariant of the stress tensor. This is the deviatoric stress in the ij direction. And, and then A is a constant. In general, this is just a relationship between strain and stress. Um, you'll see it written in different ways if you're a glaciologist, if you take Ginny Catania's class. Sometimes this constant A, part of it is proportional to temperature. We also might think of part of it being proportional to the fabric of the ice, and we might apply an enhancement factor that we write as an E. So sometimes you might see the same relationship as Ea as a function of T, and then those other things. Thinking about queso day, I thought that having eat in our <laughs> stress strain relationship maybe kind of uh, was a, uh, that's what I thought of when I saw that. And I had never thought of it in that way before. <laughs> but in general, a, a viscous fluid is characterized by a relationship between stress and strain that looks something like this that a strain rate is proportional to an applied stress with some kind of viscosity that describes how those two things interact. And so if we think about our relationship uh, that we found for ice as looking something like this viscous fluid relationship, we can write an effective viscosity for ice. That is this eta, a one over two A, and then that tau, that stress in there. And so what does that mean if we unpack this viscosity of ice? The fact that we have tau in denominator, it means that the effective viscosity of ice actually decreases as a function of the applied stress. It's called a strain softening material. The more stress that's applied, the less viscous it is. We also have power, uh, tau is to the power of n minus one. So we think of glacier ice as what's called a non-Newtonian fluid where there's a power law relationship between stress and strain rather than a linear one. This um, constant that's in here, like I mentioned before, it can, be, can also be a function of many things. Um, some that we commonly think about are like temperature, impurities in the ice, the crystal fabric orientation. 
And in numerical modeling, like I showed before, um, we might consider that constant to be an uh, actual function of temperature because we can predict the thermodynamics of the situation and then use some other constant to encompass all of those other uncertainties that we have. And, and so what does this actually look like to consider ice as a viscous fluid, but then think about how ice is actually made? So in those equations before, what would result from those kinds of equations is a relationship between strain rate and stress that's going to be uh, that's going to change depending on what this um, exponent for n is. And these are different kinds of liquids are described by these different exponents for n. These are the kind of relationships that we would actually use in our ice sheet model. How do we know what that exponent is? Is from laboratory studies where people will go in and here in log log space, the slope of this line is going to give you what this uh, n value should be because we've gone into log log. These different symbols are ice that's taken, uh, experiments done on ice at different temperatures. And so then you can see what is the impact of uh, that constant a that sits in front of that equation. But really, when we think about how an ice sheet is made, it's being formed by little pieces of snow that fall and slowly densify and turn into ice. And so at the very micro level, Ice is actually has a hex hexagonal crystal structure. It looks something like this. Um, because of the crystal structure of ice, it actually has preferred orientation. So when ice crystals are forming, there's a, you, the hexagonal part that's symmetrical, but then another axis that's uh, this C axis. And ice is actually about um, almost two orders of magnitude easier to deform a perpendicular to that axis than it is to deform across that axis. And if you look at, so, and these are um, examples if you do a thin section of ice to look at the grains and how the grains are oriented, what you notice is as you get deeper and deeper in an ice sheet, the grains will get bigger. And also these, these colors representing the orientations of the C axis, these colors sometimes can tend to converge, can tend to move in one direction as the ice uh, experiences more strain and its viscosity changes. So as we think about ice on earth and what might be changing the viscosity of ice on earth, I think it's important to remember that we have these small grain scale processes that ultimately add up to the large scale behavior that allows us to think of ice as working kind of like a fluid. And so how does that apply to Northeast Greenland? I wanna give two examples from the recent literature. So here is a paper where they looked at this Northeast Greenland ice stream we were looking at before in satellite observations over the last 30 years from 1985 to 2018 and found that the ice stream has been accelerating by about uh, one meter per year, even in these far upstream areas. And what's interesting about this is we really don't have any known uh, mechanism in terms of what can cause ice to accelerate this far inland away from the coast. Sometimes we think about as the ocean is warming and the glaciers start discharging more, it's sort of pulling the ice more quickly out. But here, 800 kilometers from the coast, what could be causing the ice to accelerate? And so these authors tested three different things in a model. They said maybe the ice, maybe this area where the ice is fast flowing fast, it has something to do with water at the base. Maybe that got wider and that's what's causing the ice to accelerate. They thought maybe if the ice sheet is getting thicker, that could cause a sort of pile up of more ice behind it and that could cause it to accelerate. Or it could be getting softer in the shear margins, these areas where it sort of starts to accelerate, that viscosity could be changing. And so they ran three separate models and they looked at how does the um, acceleration in those models compare to where they see the sort of peak acceleration in their uh, observations. And what they conclude is that they think the most likely, really based on the difference between where the peak of the orange line is and the peak of the blue line is, they think that softening of the shear margins is actually the most likely uh, mechanism for the recent acceleration of this ice stream over just the past 30 years, which is a pretty um, remarkable observation of the way that a changing viscosity might be actually changing ice on the planet today. And then the second example I want to give from the same place 
is actually looking at how changes in that grain scale process might also be affecting the viscosity. And so here's another example from this ice stream. Um, here we're also sort of in the upper, this upper area, actually in this little box, this um, E-grip is a new deep ice core that's being drilled. They just got to the bottom this year. And so that's why there's a lot of data from this region. But in this region, people use cross polarized radar to look at how changes in the ice fabric itself are evolving from outside the ice stream to inside the ice stream. And what they found, so starting on this side, these um, little circles with the like dark pots, those are describing the overall mean orientation of the crystal fabric. So you can think of something like uh, this plot with this one dark circle, that's where all of the ice crystals are sharing an orientation where they're all pointing up. So they're much easier to deform in one direction compared to another. And then in sort of this more diffuse fabric, that's where the crystal structures are facing in different directions. And so they may deform uh, less easily in one direction compared to another. And what they found when they compared the fabric from inside the ice stream and outside the ice stream is that the ice is about an order of magnitude harder to deform once it gets into the ice stream because of the changing of this crystal structure as it accelerates and moves into the ice stream. And so that uh, yeah, results in a relatively large change in terms of the viscosity of the ice, how easy it is to internally deform, even as the ice accelerates because it's sliding more along the bed. So in summary, and as we go back to trying to understand what, what might be happening in this weird place in Northeast Greenland, Treating ice as a viscous fluid is what allows us to model it in a large scale and see it as a continuum. And laboratory experiments have showed that we can indeed treat ice like a viscous fluid with an effective viscosity that is stress dependent and also has a relationship with temperature, impurities, and even the fabric of the crystals themselves. But really understanding how the ice is evolving today and then taking that to tell us something about how it may have changed in the past and into the future that relies on being able to make connections between what's happening, even at the individual grain scale, all the way up to the size of the ice sheet. That's all. Happy queso day. <laughs>
Um, but it could be now we're thinking that the viscosity also plays a role. The fact that the ice is flowing changes its um, how easy it is to deform. And that's actually also uh, one of the reasons why it might look like it does today in the absence of a strong topographic control. Cool. Yeah, maybe. Uh, does more like viscous properties of ice tend to create like more elongated features like bed forms and stuff? Is that what they do to this region or any other region? Bed forms like um, like drum ones or something. What gets left behind? Yeah. By... You know, um, Michaela, I think the Probably there's a difference between like sedimentary features, features that are built up of sediment versus um, erosive features that are carved into actual bedrock. And the viscosity of the ice. Um, no, you I, don't, don't, I don't think it would be the strongest determinant of whether erosion is happening. I think it would be more. Um, like in a sedimentary feature, the availability of water to be moving things around and being close to the melting point. I mean, the thing is at the bed, so at the temperatures that ice exists on Earth from like minus 50 C to zero C, the just the, from the temperature alone in that viscosity parameter, the effective viscosity, that changes the viscosity of ice by like three orders of magnitude. So ice at the bed of Antarctica is like a thousand times more viscous than ice at the surface where it's really, really cold. Um, but it still is not like super viscous. And um, once you start getting to those warmer temperatures, I think the more important thing is the like production of water and water to actually be able to form those things. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. That's good. Yeah. 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 Isn't that interesting? So is that why uh because the ice is harder to form in the stream? So if there's a nice elevation, the whole stream is not isolated to that. Yeah. That's why we can see the isolation is greater and it's further in the in the area of the that stream. That's all. Yeah, so um what the if like if you look just at the, the acceleration in this upstream part, the the observation that like they really focus on here and in the in this paper they also have some like GPS uh, data to, to back it up. The acceleration is happening mostly at the shear margins. And so it's not that the center of the ice stream up here is flowing faster, it's that the margins are flowing faster. Where and, and so that's where they get the idea of this like softening is occurring in the shear margins. In the study where they looked at the change in the orientation of the fabric, the biggest changes in the in the fabric are actually once you're already in this ice stream itself. And so the idea is that there's a transformation that's occurring. So as the ice is flowing, so this dotted line being the ice stream. This is from a model, and these are their observations. And so these are sort of the what the conclusions are based on. But the idea is that as it's flowing across these shear margins, that's when the change in the orientation is happening that's causing the ice to harden in the direction of flow versus in the other observation, it's really that these those shear margins themselves, the ice is accelerating through the shear margins. And so could that be related to the same process? Yes, for sure. Because they're both of those things are happening in this sort of like localized right where the uh, ice stream is beginning. But does the change in fabric mean that the ice in the stream is also accelerating. So far, it doesn't look like the, the center of the stream is accelerating. So it just means that um, that change is happening to the crystal structure, but it's not necessarily leading to more acceleration in the ice stream itself. Does that answer? I have a question. Michaela, why you got three questions and I did <laughs> <laughs> Now there's time for, no, the well, there's time time not. Let's see. It is 301, and that concludes the end of our discussion. <laughs>